week's episode is brought to you by Support the Mountain's Herbal Parasite Cleanse. This formula targets the small and large intestinal tracts and larvae, the most broad-spectrum formula available today. 100% organic, formulated by Dr. Mikio Sanki, author of the Esoteric Acupuncture Series. For 10% off your first bottle, visit shopyogahub.com and use the coupon code CLEANSE at checkout. Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Souza Ma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, Dr. Woolman. Hello, Christina. How are you? Good day to you. It's gorgeous. (laughs) Today is the first day of spring. It is, and I'm springing. Yep, and there's a there was a uh, a solar eclipse today. Oh, was there? I missed it. Well, we all missed it. You had to be in certain parts of the world. Oh, okay. Yeah, but a lot of uh, great things going on. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide today, along with Christina, as we travel through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy in search of optimal health. And today, Christina, you know, back problems, back pain, lower back pain, upper, upper back pain, it's one of the leading causes of disabilities around the world. Mm. Uh, it's, it's more of a leading cause than maybe 300 other different types of problems. So today, we're going to be speaking with a specialist uh, in back problems, Dr. Hyun Bay. And I will introduce him in just a few moments. But before we go, anybody want to talk to us? How do they get in touch? Thank you, Dr. Willman. At any time during the show, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment simply by scrolling down on your screen and typing it into the comment box. Be sure to click submit, of course. Um, Now, you can do this at any time. So if you're listening to this show um, a year later, a year and a half later, please just feel free to do so. And we will make sure that we get your comment or question over to our special guests or even Dr. Willman. Um, Now, if you're listening to this as a podcast, give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK, 818-LET'S-TALK. It's never too late to answer your questions and have your concerns. Thank you so much, Dr. Willman. Excellent, Christina. So today, uh, we're very privileged to be speaking with Dr. Hyun Bae. He's an orthopedic surgeon and a spine specialist. He's also the medical director and the education director at the Cedar sinai Spine Center in Los Angeles, California. He's a researcher and he's a leader in minimally invasive microsurgeries. And we're going to be talking about many of the things that he does, very innovative in terms of growth factor and disc disease and spinal cord injuries. Uh, This is all going to be very interesting and hopefully helpful to all of our audience. So I would like to, without further ado, introduce Dr. Hyun Bae. Greetings, Hyun. Greetings. Hello, Dr. Bae. Welcome to our show. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. (laughs) Hyun, we're going to be uh, talking today with you. And as the medical guide, I would like to just give our audience uh, an idea of the path we're going to take. First, we want to learn a little bit about you and what got you interested in medicine and spine surgery. We want to talk to a little bit about the the education that's required for you to help some people that might be thinking of doing something you do. We're going to talk about spine and back problems in general to give people some information maybe on how to protect their backs a little. And then I want to get into a lot of the new research you're doing and what's out there in terms of new things for surgery and to help people with their serious back problems. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. It sounds like five episodes, though, but it sounds great. (laughs) That means he's coming back already. (laughs) That's right. It is five episodes, but we're really good at getting a lot in in one episode, and uh, hopefully we'll go past that. So, The first part is we always like to show the heart and soul of the healers that we talk to. What got you interested in medicine in general, being a healer? What were your influences? And then how did you go into orthopedic surgery and then spine surgery? Well, I think, um, you know, it's probably not as exciting as I'd like. I mean, I, you know, we immigrated when I was about two years old. And so I'm from an immigrant family. And, um, you know, certainly a big influence was my parents who said, 
you know, you've got to get a job eventually, you know, we're new in this country and you got to work hard and figure something out. And I think the medical profession at that time was always kind of a guaranteed profession. Um, mm-hmm. I've always had that in the back of my mind, but it, early on, I was really a tinker. I'd break things apart. I'd break radios apart, electronics apart, whatever I could do. And I'd put them back together. And I did that from a very, very early age. And uh, that kind of fostered my kind of desire to go into engineering. And so I graduated actually in biomechanical engineering. Ah. And then and then really from biomechanical engineering, I thought, you know, what, am, what do I really want to do? And I thought, you know, the challenges of the body were certainly very mechanical, but also very biological. And so you had this whole other kind of avenue of um, of treatment that wasn't just pure mechanics. You really had to integrate the two. And that challenge is really what brought me into spine and what really brought me into medicine. So after basically graduating engineering, I spent a lot of time doing engineering research and said, you know, not that this wasn't challenging enough, but it was really mm-hmm. missing that kind of biological factor. And uh, then I went to med school, did a lot of biological research. And then really from what career path to choose, it was so natural for me after doing biomechanics, which involves structures, to really go into spine. Because obviously spine, you know, the axial spine is really the main structure that holds up your body. Mm-hmm. Wow, what a, what a journey. <laughs> That's Amazing. great, going from engin- engineering. It, but it all makes sense yes. when you think about it. You know, it's just uh, looking backwards, it, it just flows very well. Mm. What's oh, absolutely. The, what's the educational requirements to become you? This is, <laughs> this, this oh, is gosh. For, this yeah, is for you, people you, that uh, may want to be looking at a career path. And, right. and so we always try and cover this for people so sure, they have sure. an idea. So how do absolutely. we become you? It's years and years and years of schooling. Basically, I just graduated last year. Um, <laughs> honestly, uh, honestly, it's, um, you know, it's four years of college, okay? And then it's four years of postgraduate training, which is med school. So med school is, by definition, four years, minimum. Right. I actually did it in five years. Whether that was, um, maybe it was a little remedial, but I did a lot of research in med school. So I spent a year at the NIH doing kind of growth factor research during med school. Mm -hmm. So I graduated in five years, which actually in my med school was quite typical because a lot of us were going into research at the time. Now, once you finish med school, so now you're already kind of four to, I would say, eight to nine years after college. I mean, sorry, after high school. Right. And it's not uncommon that some patients, some people go to med school for really four to six years. So I would say the average is probably eight to nine years after high school. And then once you're done with med school, you choose, I guess, a field of specialty. And that would either be orthopedics, uh, neurosurgery. It could be cardiology. It could be radiology. And so for orthopedics, it is a five-year training program. So on top of that nine years, you check on five years. And so now you're at 14 years. And then after that orthopedic training program, many of us, do a fellowship in a certain field of orthopedics, okay? Now, my fellowship was in spine surgery, so I spent another year dedicated to only spine surgery. So if you add it all together, it's about, oh gosh, what is that, nine, five, 15 years after high school. So, you know, it takes you well into your uh, 30s before you really finish And then can really start your practice. And I love how they call it a practice, right? But but it really is. Yeah, you know, it's it's very interesting because it really shows that someone that wants to go into this field and become a healer like yourself, there's a a commitment and a dedication that's a lifetime process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and it doesn't end even even after you finish all your training and you begin, as you say, practicing. You still have to continue your education and what's new out there and learning new things all the time. So it's a continuous process. Yeah, I would say when you're done with those fifteen years, you now are just at the beginning. You know, it's 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 you know it's kind of the it's kind of the beginning of the end, but. You know, when you're done with all your training in those 15 years and you're well in your 30s, when you start your practice, that's really the beginning. 
You know, it's kind of, and you really have to learn how to treat patients on your own, what things work, what things don't work. And absolutely, you want to provide the best for your patients. So to do that, you really have to stay up with patient care, technology, new treatments. If you're really going to be a top quality physician, you really have to keep up with technology. I love the way you're saying that. So that's really good. Mm. What, Hyun, what's, you've been doing this for a while now, obviously. What's the magic in it for you? Oh, you know, I think it's an incredible challenge. I mean, you know, there's no doubt that, you know, with all the, um, the things that the requirements of being a physician, um, it is still a great profession to go to every single day. I wake up every single day thinking, hey, this is not a bad gig. I get to <laughs> go to work. I get to help patients. I get to operate on patients and really able to change their, you know, their, their physical being and hopefully heal them. I mean, and that's, you know, I, I don't take that for granted. I mean, it's, a, it's a very easy thing to say that, Hey, you know, we try to heal people, but the idea that you can affect change and actually heal another human being, it, it's, it's, it's a pretty incredible thing. It's, it's really not a bad gig. You know, it, it, it's interesting because I worked in the emergency department for many years and the things that gave me that gratification were when I actually was able to do something in the moment to relocate a shoulder or a, or another joint or to suture someone up and, and see a result right in that moment. That is, it's a great feeling. So I want to get into the back right now. Let's, let's not waste any time. <clears throat> First of all, it seems like as I said at the beginning, the back, uh, we have lots of problems with the back. It's a big disability, pain, it's, it's taking over the world. What, is there a flaw design with, with us as a human, as a species? Yeah, I think the biggest flaw currently is, is that we are outliving our backs. You know, when we became homo sapiens and we started walking, you know, 100,000 years ago, it's just, you know, our average lifespan was really late 20s, early 30s. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can make it to 40 and that would, you know, you'd be a grandfather, you know, you'd be, you know, old. Right. And that's the problem. I mean, really, you know, our backs or our spines have not evolved. And so, you know, they're not, you know, they're just not built to last 80 years you know, their prime is really in their 20s and their 30s. And so what happens is, is that as you get into your 40s and 50s, everybody has changes related to age, everybody in their spine. And, you know, it's, it's really how we support that and how we get the best longevity out of our axial spine. And so there are a lot of th things that are health related that are trying that we can do to help that. But I think the main cause of low back pain and the fact and why we see it in so many 40s and 50-year-olds is really because, because our backs have not evolved as we have. Our lifespan has increased dramatically, but our, but our, our axial spine, the mechanical structure, I would say still has the same type of longevity that it did 100,000 years ago. Mm. Um, Dr. Bay, um, you know, I come from, from I, I love the physical fitness. I love all that, you know, and sadly to say they're removing it from our school systems, <laughs> etc. Now, do you feel that that the way our society and our cultures um, have sort of morphed through the years, that is like less and less of the farming and the outdoor labor work, etc., that, that we've also come to a state in our society where we're really lazy. Yeah. We're really lazy. Yeah. And we don't even... Uh, I find so many people are not conscious, you know, at a childhood stage to, you know, that physical exercise to basically sustain the body and learn to stretch the muscles and, and the tendons and just keep the body mobile. That um, there's this huge generation that I've seen that everybody's got back pain. And I go, oh, you're sitting all day. They don't want to stretch. They don't want to do anything. You bring them into therapy. Do you do your exercises? No. <laughs> you know, so... So do you think that's also part of it and not just us outliving the spine? Yes. I mean, there's no question that the, you know, there's certainly a genetic component to the spine. Some spines are going to last longer than mm -hmm. others, just like some cars will last longer than other cars. But, 
it's how you treat the car or how you treat the spine mm-hmm. that's going to make a big, big difference. And I do think that, you know, our society is a very sedentary society. And there's no question that it's diet-related as well. It's obesity-related. It's nutrition-related. And all those things are going to have a significant impact on the spine itself. I mean, if, you don't, if you're not active, you don't get out in the sun, you don't get vitamin D, you don't make your bones strong, you don't eat a good, you know, nutritious diet, you know, you're overweight, you don't get exercise, there's no question that you, as opposed to your peers who are doing all the right things, are going to have more spine-related problems. Mm. You know? I will tell you, one good thing is, is that it's amazing. A lot of research has been done in, in what degenerates the spine, degenerates discs, but there's one thing that's always come out, and that's really smoking. And so the fact that it seems that in most developed societies, the smoking incidence is coming down, that truly, I do think, is going to make an impact. That's a, that's a significant issue for the spine and the discs themselves are cartilage. Mm-hmm. And I do think that you know, the decrease in smoking will certainly help, not only in spinal disease, but in many other diseases, many other diseases. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's really interesting yeah. because the smoking seems to come up, no matter who we interview, smoking seems to come up uh, in the process. Mm. So Absolutely. One- one of the things that we talk about on this show a lot is prevention. Uh, we try to uh, look at things, obviously, so that we can prevent disease rather than looking at the next part of how to heal disease. But, of course, people do get diseases, and we need to heal them, and we'll talk about that. But I want to focus for a few minutes on prevention. We're seeing now where we talk about uh people that are sitting, standing, moving incorrectly, lying in their beds incorrectly. So we see advertisements for the best uh, beds to sleep in. Now we see desks that move up and down, chairs that are uh, standing chairs, and they're recommending standing more. How do we move? Uh, People are putting uh, orthotics on our feet. Do you have any thoughts on lying, sitting, standing, moving in terms of prevention of back problems? Well, and this goes for really every joint and ligaments and tendons. All connective tissue heals better with motion. So it's amazing that, you know, many years ago, back in the 80s, you know, if you had a tendon that was broken or a tendon that was stretched or injured or a ligament, we all thought that immobilization was the best way to heal. And we realized that actually controlled motion is the best way to heal connective tissue. And so joints, tendons, ligaments, really, they're best off in their kind of primary mode, and that's with a little bit of stress, moving about. And, you know, as a general thing, I don't want to get into so many technical things that you got to have this bed or that bed, or you got to have a moving chair or a upright desk. But in reality, you really have to keep your joints moving. The spine is a joint. It's just many, many joints. And stretching, moving, getting up, getting outside, physical activity Aerobic activity is extremely important for the spine. The disc, and that is kind of the cartilage in between the two primary bones, and that's really what allows the spine to move, okay? The spine has an incredible task. I mean, you know, if you really think about it, the spine has to hold you up, so it has to be like an Eiffel Tower, okay? Mm -hmm. It has to hold the body up for years and years through everything that you want to do, dance, run, uh, gymnastics, um, you know, but also it has to be flexible. Now, there are not many structures that are stiff and flexible at the same time, especially controlled flexion or controlled movement. And so if you really look at the spine itself, it's got an amazing task and it's an amazing organ. Mm. It's a very stable structure that allows incredible flexibility. And that is challenging, incredibly challenging. You can build an incredibly tall structure and make it very stable and stiff. But you take that tall structure and you try to make it move in many different directions, it's a whole different engineering requirement. And the body has been able to do that with the spine. Now, what allows that flexibility is is obviously the muscles and the tendons that control it. But in between the bones is the disc. And that is that fibro cartilage kind of uh, material that allows the flexibility. It's the shock absorber. And Mm -hmm. that, what most people don't know, is very avascular, meaning that blood vessels do not penetrate it. So it's very hard to get nutrients to that disc, okay? So that's why it's so important 
to try to bring oxygen to the disc. And so exercise, aerobic exercise, bringing in oxygen tension. So, you know, enhancing, you know, your, your oxygenation ability will basically provide nutrients to the disc. And over time, that will make a significant impact. And that's why one of the reasons smoking is so poor for the disc, because that decreases your oxygen level. So you're really depriving that disc of nutrients. It appears that the back has lots of problems, and when people have pain, the question is, what do people do for it? Do you take care of it on your own? Do you see a physical therapist? Do you go to see your chiropractor? What is the proper way that you think someone should recognize their back pain, treat it first, and then if it continues, what's the best way to make the right diagnosis and make choices in terms of treatment and and, uh, healing. Sure. Um, The first thing I just want to clarify just for the audience, um, the differences between back pain and what we call axial low back pain versus like buttock and leg pain. Okay. Okay. Um, So axial, if you can imagine the Eiffel Tower, you've got a structure. And in that Eiffel Tower, there's all these electronics that pulls the elevator up and down that supplies electricity uh, to the Eiffel Tower. Now, the problem is, is that, and what I want to distinguish between is a problem in the structure that can cause back pain. So maybe that's a joint that's kind of loose or that's something that's just, it's still standing, but it may not be as strong as it was before mm-hmm. versus something that's wrong with the electrical system. Okay. Cause that can cause buttock and leg pain. And that's typically called sciatica. And that typically means that there is something in the spine because the spine has two modes. It's really, it keeps your body upright. But another important mode of that spine is, is that it really tries to protect the nervous system, okay, the central nervous system. And that also is very important. So what happens is, is that patients kind of group everything together. So if you just have back pain without buttock or leg pain, that kind of signifies it's probably more associated with the discs. It's really more axial. It's a problem in the structure, maybe postural, maybe something of that nature. You can have terrible spasms in the low back that can really cause you not being able to move, but it's mo- you can't move because it's painful. It's not because your legs are weak or there's pain shooting down the leg. Mm-hmm. Now, that type of back pain, practically everybody will experience in one time in their life. Everybody, Okay. It's the most common, okay? That type of back pain literally will, one out of five working individuals will miss a week of work, typically, to that type of pain, okay? Mm -hmm. So, good thing about that type of pain is most of the times it's transient and it will resolve. The body will heal it. Now, to make it go away faster, there are many things that you can do, okay? One thing is, is that when you really get that type of pain, you know, the first thing is, is that obviously you really can't move and you're in severe spasm, okay? And typically spasms are best treated with some type of stretching. And if you can't do it on your own, it's great to go to a physical therapist or to your internist who can prescribe you mild muscle relaxers, some mm-hmm. anti-inflammatories like uh, Advil or Naproxen or drugs like that to help you with your pain, and then get you into some type of therapy so they can really try to release those spasms for you. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and that's the primary mode. Sometimes corsets, when the, you can kind of stabilize the core, that can really, really help in that initial period. But really, after that initial period, you don't really want a corset because I, you know, again. Tendons and ligaments heal better with motion. Okay. So I think that would be the primary. It's typically non steroidals like Advil, Aleve, ibuprofen, those drugs to help control the inflammation. Getting into some type of therapy, or sometimes it's a trainer, sometimes you can do it at home, but you want to start doing light stretching because that spasm of the muscle causes tremendous pain. And you really want to slowly start distracting that or putting tension on a spasm. Like, you know, many of you are, um, are athletes and you've seen when you were in a game or, or a, in any type of athletic activity, when you've had a spasm, what the athletic trainers do, and they really try to stretch that muscle out. It's really the same. 
Okay. And then finally, if it's really chronic, you do want to get into a good physical therapy regimen or seek a professional, a trainer or a physical therapist or um, anybody that really uh, knows the spine really, really well to help train those muscles so you can develop a core, get you into a program where your, 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 the core muscles you're developing are balanced from the abs to the paraspinal muscles in the back. So if you think of it as a column in the spine in the middle, you want to train the, the muscles in the front of the spine and the muscles in the back of the spine and make sure they're very well balanced to have the best result. Beautiful. Pilates does that. Are you? Uh, do you work with a lot of Pilates instructors? Yes, I, th- I think Pilates is fantastic. Okay, I think it's absolutely fantastic for the core. I th- also think yoga is fantastic. It's fantastic for the core. The thing about I like about yoga is is that a lot of times yoga can be done by many ages, and it's a lot of isometric exercises. So it, it, it really, I just. I think that's an, that's an amazing field. I love yoga. I love Pilates. Physical therapy is great. And what's amazing is a lot of physical therapists incorporate all these kind of other modalities into physical therapy itself. So mm-hmm. you'll see a lot of physical therapists that are Pilates-based, a lot of physical therapies that do ha- incorporate yoga into their practice. But I think, you know, as a general maintenance, because once you start physical therapy, you go to a place, you have a prescription, but as general maintenance, you know, for your spine, I think, and for fitness, I love yoga and I love Pilates. That's great. You know, before we get into some of the treatments, uh, I just want to diverge for a moment. You mentioned athletics. Do you have any quick thoughts on all of the athletics that we see, the contact sports? I know that offers... uh, a lot in the way of patience for you, but what are your general thoughts on how athletics is for us as a species? Well, you know, I mean, there's no question that our spine is meant to take a beating, okay? But, you know, it is, when we talk about low back pain and degenerative disease, because you hear that a lot, right? Mm-hmm. It, is, it is a disease of wear and tear. So, You know, the more wear you put on it, you know, the more real wear, if you're talking about contact sports, you know, there's no, there's absolutely a correlation to those patients who are going to develop back pain in the future, you know, and it really is the same for the knees and the hips as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the the discs are really cartilage. And so if you look at football players who've played professional football and you look at all the linemen, by the time that they're 40 and 50, they all have disc, I mean, they all have knee replacements and hip replacements. And a lot of them can hardly walk. And that is really due to all the trauma they've placed. Now, we're all not high, you know, professional athletes and we don't participate at that level. But, you know, there's certainly an extreme. And I think you really have to be careful and balance out that extreme. You know, it is good to exercise. It is good to do athletics. It is good to participate in sports. But then again, there no question is an extreme where, you know, there's a trade-off. You're, you're putting, you're placing tremendous wear on your spine. And at the end stage, you know, there's no question that you're going to see those effects. You know, I do think those sports is incredibly important in, in the younger age group. This is when your spine is the most flexible. This is when your spine can tolerate it. And, you know, there's so many other benefits of athletics. It's weight control. It's uh, mental physicality. It's, um, um, you know, the endorphins that, you know, that supply mm-hmm. to your brain are so important. It's the hyperoxygenation. It's, it's kind of like getting your blood cells revved up. So I think at the end of the day, I would say athletics is incredibly important. I think that's very beneficial for the spine. I certainly think that's better than being um, sedentary. Um, but then again, I do think extreme, you know, you can take it to an extreme level and, you know, if, if you're that person, you know, there may be some trade-offs later down the line. Uh, we see that certainly. So I want to now move forward as if the person that had the back pain did all the things that you said, they went to the physical therapist, they started the yoga, the Pilates, they're doing all the exercises, taking the muscle relaxants and it's now it's getting worse. So at some point, they're going to have to come to you, right? True. What's the workup that you do, and how do you move forward with someone that possibly needs a surgical procedure? So for for a spine surgeon, and, you know, their primary mode is really surgery, 
we, mm-hmm. we always want to distinguish between, is this a problem of the axial spine, the loading of the spine, or, or the mechanical structure, or is this a problem of the structure around the central nervous system or the nerve roots? Mm-hmm. Okay. So if, if by the time you've come to me, you're probably you know, had an MRI or you're going to get an MRI, because I want to distinguish between, is this a structural problem? Okay. Or is this a problem of the central nervous system, meaning are the nerves being impacted? Is there pressure on the nerves? Do you have a disc herniation? Do you have weakness? And so that's my primary distinction. Now, if you have sciatica or pain running down the leg or weakness where you cannot walk, that's a completely different kind of um, diagnosis. And you need to be seen by a physician and probably need to be seen by a spine surgeon or a spinal specialist to really figure out what to do because nerves do not like pressure. And if you leave it for too long, they may not recover because they don't have the regenerative capacity that other connective tissues have. So bone regenerates, cartilage can regenerate to some degree, tendons and muscles heal. But we do know that nerves do not heal as well, that the regenerative capacity is not as great. So we want to make sure that the CNS or the central nervous system is intact and there's no issue. If there's some nerve that's in jeopardy, then that should be seen by a spinal specialist and treated in a whole different spectrum. Okay, so let's say it's not stenosis where the nerves are being compressed or it's not a disc herniation where the nerve is being impacted to some degree where you're having tremendous leg pain or you're not having weakness and it's pure low back pain, which is the most common condition. Once I see and I rule out that it's not a central nervous problem and it's really in the axial spine or the mechanical part of the spine, then a lot of times we will try to optimize the spine as much as possible to see what you can tolerate. So we will make sure that you've seen the right physical therapist. We will make sure that you've done Pilates. That we'll make sure that everything was appropriately done and maybe even move you to a higher level, like a physical therapist that we know or an athletic trainer, somebody that we know that specializes it to, to really concentrate on what your issue is. Because a lot of times it can be related to a disc level that they may have not concentrated on. Okay, so maybe a L2-3 disc when actually most of the physical therapists will concentrate on the 4-5 level or the bottom level. Mm-hmm. And so once we differentiate that diagnosis, we also kind of give the patient a clear perspective. Number one, that is not involving the CNS. Number two, that this pain that they're having is not going to cause any type of neurotrauma or nerve trauma. That it's very typical axial low back pain that many patients experience. What's also amazing is, is that it majority of the time will go away. The problem is, is that how long is it going to take? Okay. So if, if it takes, you know, greater than six months a year, then a lot of times we do have to intervene because a patient cannot be disabled for six months to a year in their 40s and 50s because that's mm-hmm. just the, the opportunity cost is too great. A lot of times in those patients, we will offer surgery for, okay? If the pain is really not in that year time frame or six-month time frame, you know, we are still trying to manage this as conservatively as possible, providing a lot of support. And that really is optimization of the spine, seeing what their work environment is. What can we do to change the work environment? What can we do to change their activity level? What can we do to change their alignment and their posture, okay, to see if we can buy some time so that the spine can kind of heal itself. What's amazing about the spine is, is that, and this is why we have pain in your 40s and 50s, is that if you think of a balloon, when you blow up that balloon, as tight as possible. That is the most stable period. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, or, or, um, or the shock absorber in your Nike air tennis shoes. When you, when the air is, when you first buy them, it's really, really taut. Okay. And that you can think of that as a shock absorber between the vertebral bodies in your spine. That's the disc. Okay. Now, that is, the, that is when you're like 18, 19, 20, 21 in your 20s. That's how taut the disc is. If you look at it on an MRI, you'll see how bright it is, how full of fluid it is. It's just, it's nice and plump. 
Now, what happens is, is that in your 40s and 50s, you'll lose about 20% of the volume on the inside. So if you think it's fluid, 20% of that air or fluid will kind of degenerate or leak out with the aging process. And then, if you think about it, that is typically the most unstable period, meaning that now you have this taut balloon or this capsule and you've taken air out of it, and now it's relatively loose. It's kind of saggy and loose. And that is when we experience low back pain, okay? It's really kind mm-hmm. of that transition zone, all right? Now, if you take that a little bit further into your 60s and 70s, you'll then lose about 50 to 60% of the contents of the air or the fluid inside it that's the kind of the shock absorber. And now it's not saggy anymore, but it's not providing you much shock absorption. It's pretty stiff, okay? But it's stable. So what happens is, is that you lose flexibility. You're not as limber anymore. You're a little bit more stiff. You may not have the same dance moves that you had when you're 20s, but <laughs> magically enough, you have less pain. Okay? Nice. So, so it's really, you know, it's, it's a part of trying to gauge, you know, how do we manage you during that transition zone? Mm-hmm. Very few patients need surgery. Okay? Hopefully, we can optimize the spine to kind of get you through that transition zone where the disc will stabilize itself. And yes, you change, you know, you, 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 know, you give up pain, right? But unfortunately, you gain stiffness right. and, maybe, and maybe some height loss, right? right. So, you know, that's, the, that's, that's really the physiologic process that we're dealing with. And a lot of back pain and spinal problems or spinal disease is very natural. It's really the aging process. And it's, it's kind of, you know, as physicians, chiropractors, physical therapists, acupuncturists, it, it's really trying to optimize the spine and the symptoms during that transition zone and not to be overly aggressive. When, so someone comes in to see you. Uh, that was very good, by the way. I really uh, appreciated all of that, especially at the end when you talked about some of the alternative integrative therapies. Everybody's looking for different ways to make it better without that surgery. So the person goes to their orthopedic surgeon or the neurosurgeon, the spine specialist, and the spine specialist uh, meets them in the office afterwards and goes over the MRI with them. And a number of words come up that, of course, as we're saying them as physicians, we understand it, but the people may be blanking out when they're hearing certain things. So I'd like to go over maybe three or four definitions that you could give briefly, and then I want to go into therapy. So they hear the word stenosis. What does that mean? So stenosis. So stenosis means constriction, okay? And what it's describing is, is a tightness around the CNS or the nerves themselves, the central nervous system. So it's the spinal canal. So it's the secondary function or, or, you know, the other function of the spine is to really protect the central nervous system. And that's done with a canal. And so as you move around, you can develop arthritis and slowly that arthritis, the bone spurs will impinge and close down the canal, very similar to a a pipe underneath the sink. Mm -hmm. Okay. Over time, you may develop rust and debris where the pipe gets smaller and smaller, and the water may not flow as well. Well, in the spinal canal of the vertebral um, structure, it's the same thing. Over time, you may develop arthritis, which will narrow the canal, and it will constrict the nerves. And once that happens, you will start developing weakness. So patients will have difficulty with walking. And so that's kind of the secondary thing. So if you have pain or back pain associated with stenosis or difficulty walking with stenosis, those conditions, we do operate quite a bit because we do want to protect the central nervous system. And it's very easy just to relieve that pressure by removing the debris or the arthritis. And then you have a clear nerve pathway, and then you can return back to normal function. Excellent. How about osteophyte? So osteophyte um, is really a bone spur. Osteo is bone, and a phyte means like a little nugget, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's like a bone nugget. And all it's saying is is that you're developing arthritis. Now, it can be anywhere, but it's usually always around the joints. When we mention it, it's typically around the disc space, which is the joint, the big joint in the front, or the facet joints, which are the joints in the back of the 
vertebral column. Mm-hmm. So those joints also can develop bone spurs or, or osteophytes. So bone spurs and osteophytes are synonymous. It's a bone nugget. Excellent. Herniated disc. So herniated disc, I think that, that is a good one. A herniated disc typically signifies a, the cartilage or the, the plump, the disc that I'm talking about all the time between the two vertebral bodies. When that herniates or when that leaks out, and then it can hit a nerve root. So that leakage can then impact a nerve root or the central nervous system and cause tremendous leg pain. Okay. Mm-hmm. And some of those, yes, we do operate on. Most amazingly enough, a lot of those will also get better because that herniation can sometimes be resorbed by the body. Okay. Actually, mm-hmm. about 85% of those kind of herniations are taking care of the body, and you don't need anything done. We only operate probably at, at the end of the day about 5% or less of disc herniations. But I do want to toss one other thing in there for you, Glenn. Okay. If you look at an MRI report, okay, any MRI report of anybody between the ages of 45 and 55, it's going to sound terrible. It's going to mention <laughs> disc degeneration. It's going to mention disc bulges. It's going to mention uh, height loss. You know, these disc bulges that you see on the MRI that they always measure in millimeters, like you have a two millimeter disc bulge or four millimeter disc bulge causing mild something, you know, moderate something. These, this description in an MRI report is natural. It really describes a natural aging process. Okay. So, you know, you shouldn't really read this report and say, oh my God, I'm, I'm in so <laughs> much trouble because it really is normal. Okay. And it's really up to the medical professional, the spine specialist, to look at that MRI and really discern what's really natural or what's really natural, but may be causing you a little issue. Okay. All right. That's great. Uh, this is all great. So we're going to start moving our way into therapies now. And usually one of the first things that uh, someone might suggest before the surgery is they talk about, oh, let's try an epidural on you. So please explain that and your thoughts about it. So I think the best description of an epidural is, is that the name itself. So the structure around the CNS, so in the spinal canal, there's nerves. The structure around the nerves is something called a a dura, okay? And that's just the sac around the nerves. So an epidural is something outside the dura or just adjacent to the dura. So typically what it'll be is it'll be an epidural steroid injection. And what that means is is that we're going to inject steroids right outside the dural sleeve. And what does that do? Well, steroids is a very potent anti-inflammatory. And it basically is a way of giving you a huge dose of aspirin or ibuprofen uh, or a, right at the source of inflammation. Okay. So it's, it's kind of a direct way of giving you a, a, a big uh, Advil, okay? but it's a little bit more invasive. But typically, it's very, very effective, especially if it's your first one. Now, we use them for many things. We can use them for back pain because we know that a portion of port of back pain is really inflammation. But a lot of times also with stenosis. So when you have the constricture around your CNS, that causes tremendous amount of inflammation because your nerves do not like that pressure. And if you inject a lubricant around the nerves, like an epidural steroid, that it controls the inflammation, that can give you a really, really good relief. Beautiful. So now we're going to go into some of the therapies. When people think about having to have surgery, the back surgery, they picture this really long uh, incision going up the whole back sometimes, and then they think that they're going to be fused and they're not going to be able to move anymore. That might have been the case many, many years ago. But things have changed. We've gotten a lot better now at what we do, and especially a lot of the work that you do, what what we even call now minimally invasive procedures. What's going on in therapy now from the point of view of the surgeon? What's new for us, and what can we help people to understand that back surgery is no longer the terrible thing or the difficult thing or the extensive thing that it was many years ago? Absolutely. So... You know, there is a whole new field of minimally invasive spine surgery, just like in every other surgical field. 
okay? Um, it almost is an oxymoron or it is an oxymoron. I mean, minimally invasive spine surgery may not be two words that should go together. It's almost <laughs> like a, a minimally invasive tax audit. I'm not sure if those two words can go together, <laughs> right? Brilliant. But, but, it, but it does make it sound better. And in, in reality, what's happened is, is that, you know, there are so many muscles around the spine. And when we started out with spine surgery, um, we would really destroy or have a lot of collateral damage around the important structures around the spine, which is the muscles, to get to the spine itself, all right? And to really put it in just one simple phrase, it's, it's kind of, you know, we are trying to treat the spine without causing the collateral damage to the muscles, Okay. Mm -hmm. So even though we're still reconstructing the spine, we're still putting hardware into the spine, we're really expect we're really respecting the soft tissue kind of covering or the environment around the spine. Because mm -hmm. we know that that is so important. And that's what we really learned. Meaning that a lot of times patients have always said, Oh, you have one spine surgery, then you have another spine surgery, then you have another spine surgery. And that somewhat is true. But a lot of that was due to the fact that we didn't, as a profession, we didn't respect the soft tissues, all the muscles, tendons, and ligaments that are around the spine. You know, we were so concentrated on the structure, the bone, the disc, the bony structure of the spine, that we didn't pay attention to the soft tissue. So we would just go there, dissect the soft tissue, uh, you know, uh, dissect the soft tissue, make huge incisions. And then just ignore the soft tissue and put them back, thinking that they would go back and, and support the spine again, in which they didn't. They would scar, and they wouldn't support the spine again. And that's led to a lot of future surgeries, okay? Because they weren't supporting the spine anymore because we've kind of um, destroyed them or caused so much damage getting to the spine. So the field of minimally invasive surgery really uses more a very targeted approach. So if you really think about the disc or a disc herniation or any issue like that, you know, these are measured in, I would say, millimeters or centimeters, okay? They're mm -hmm. not measured in inches, feet, and yards, okay? So the idea is if a problem is really only measured in millimeters and centimeters, why do we need to disrupt two feet or a foot mm -hmm. of soft tissue to get there? So we use a lot of image guidance or a lot of um, specialized retractors that only open up that little area with the aid of image guidance so that we can really get down to the, to the tissue itself, to the diseased tissue, whether it's through a microscope, an endoscope, a lot of fiber optics to visualize and take care of that truly minimally invasively. Less blood loss, less soft tissue disruption. But at the end of the day, it's really just getting getting the thing done that we need to do that we always did in the past, but doing it with a lot less collateral damage and then allowing the patient to recover a lot faster. So a fusion, okay, a fusion of one or two segments, which I would say would encompass most probably 80% of the fusions that we do is typically one or two segments. If it's done in a way that spares the soft tissue envelope, that respects all the muscles around the spine, and all we do is really fuse those two segments, most patients will not notice any loss of range of motion, okay? On the contrary, because it's causing so much pain, and this is the reason that we're doing the fusion, even when we fuse those segments, most patients have better range of motion because they now have less pain, right? Okay? That's always common. The, I think the, the way that fusion's got a really, really... Um, maybe a not so good reputation is, is that in the past when we did fusions, we would create so much damage to the soft tissues and you'd have an incredibly large incision and we'd only be fusing one level, but we'd open up the whole spine. And, you know, that can cause significant disability. That's where you get, oh, a fusion, it takes a year to recover. It doesn't. It doesn't take a year to recover. But if I create an incision that was, you know, 30 centimeters or a foot and mm -hmm. disrupted all the muscles. Yeah, it would take about a year to rehab all those muscles. You know, you're making this so nice. I almost thinking about maybe I should have a back surgery. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. making it sound so good. Exactly, exactly. It's minimally invasive. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> now, now people are starting to use lasers 
for things like stenosis. Are, do you use a laser? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, you know, you know, we've been using, or lasers have been used in spine. It's really a tool to ablate tissue. I'm sorry. It's really a tool to dissolve tissue. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it can, it can dissolve a herniated disc. It can actually cut through bone. Okay. There's nothing really magical about the laser besides the fact that it's really a focused way of removing tissue. Okay. So we've, you know, we use lasers in the past. I will tell you that most, um, Spine surgeons have moved away from lasers because there's one thing about the laser that sometimes doesn't work well around nervous tissue, okay, or the CNS is that it's there's very poor depth control, okay, oh. meaning that you know when you shine a laser pointer at something, whether it's two feet or four feet, it it'll hit its target and you'll see you'll you'll see the laser, okay, mm -hmm. now. If you're outside the central nervous system, I think lasers are great. So if you're trying to ablate something or or dissolve some tissue, lasers are fantastic. Okay, but when you're inside the spinal canal around nerves, you know we we really tend to stay away from lasers mm -hmm. because if you move the laser, there's no. I mean, even though I'm very far away from the nerve, if I just point it at the nerve. Well, I've just created tissue damage to the nerve itself because there's no depth control. Does that right. make sense? I mean, when you shine Absolutely. the laser, it goes to the end. So it's not a great tool for, um, for um, ner central, the central nervous system. Like we have so many other ways of dissolving tissue. In, like we use plasma fields. We use radio frequency. We use all these other tools that we have and it's, it's so much better because we have depth control, meaning that we have these two little probes or two little um, um, kind of uh, outlets where we know where the energy is concentrated. So when we put those two probes or the, or the probe right at the place where we want to dissolve the tissue, it'll dissolve it, you know, where you, know, you don't get that depth control with the laser. The best thing about the laser is that it sounds great. It's almost like minimally invasive surgery. It sounds great. But, you know, as a tool around nerves, lasers, we, it's not really used for that reason. Good to know that. And I'm sure our uh, listeners and viewers are uh, informed now based on what you've just told us. So I want to go into a little bit of your research in growth hormone and also in stem cell research for spinal problems. Let's talk about that. I'll sure. leave it up to you to uh, lead that part. Sure. So, you know, we, we've been talking about the aging process of the axial spine. You know, the, the disc itself, how it, it's plump at the ages of 20. But when you get into your 40s and 50s, it loses some of the fluid and it becomes a little saggy. And that's what causes back pain for a lot of patients. And, and the idea is, is that what can we do to basically increase the plumpness of the disc itself? You know, can we do something that will, that will, um, is able to put the air back into the disc or put the fluid back into the disc? So it helps us get through that period that we have terrible pain. And so, you know, obviously I equate it with a fountain of youth. It's almost like the fountain of youth of the spine. You know, how can we really kind of reverse the aging process or try to elongate it? You know, so mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't happen in our 40s and 50s, but maybe we can get it to happen in our 60s and 70s when we're, we may not be as active. And if we're active in our 60s and 70s, maybe we can get it to happen in our 80s and 90s when we're not as active. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, naturally we do look at growth factors. You know, there have been a lot of molecules that have been discovered in the last 20 years that have shown to really enhance tissue or regrow tissue, okay? I think one of the most notable because of cycling is erythropoietin or EPO. Mm -hmm. And if you give a patient EPO, they will increase their red blood cells. So we do have proteins now that will really increase tissue, okay? And so the idea is, can we identify those proteins? And so one of the proteins that have been identified are proteins or a classification called bone morphogenetic proteins. Now, they, it does say bone because that's the class, but these proteins do regenerate connective tissue, muscle, tendons, ligament, and cartilage, okay? 
And so we've experimented in the animals and in patients of injecting these growth factors into discs themselves who have back pain to try to regrow the disc or try to support the disc and hopefully stabilize the disc so the patients have relief of pain through biologic enhancement instead of through any type of surgical procedure. Okay. And the idea of stem cells really takes that one step further, you know, because we can inject all the growth factors themselves, but we may not be able to get these cells to migrate to the disc or to really enhance the disc enough. And so the idea is, is that can we also use stem cells? And that obviously is a is a big research topic now that has a lot of publicity and a lot of hype. But really trying to use cells themselves, place them inside the disc, and helpfully enhance that disc, meaning that will the cells then produce the air or the fluid to make that disc plump and stabilize the disc and hopefully decrease back pain and increase function. This is exciting. One of the big things that's one of the most tragic things that we see uh, in medicine is someone with a true complete spinal cord injury where they're a paraplegic, they can't move their legs, they're a quadriplegic from the, from the neck down, they're paralyzed. Is there, uh, what's the future of spinal cord injuries uh, for us? Yes, yeah, so spinal cord injuries is, is certainly one of the most devastating injuries. Um, again, it re- goes right back to the CNS, the central nervous system. We know that Neil's d- nerves do not have a good capacity to regenerate. Um, it's so challenging. Um, there's really two modes that are being used for spinal cord injury now. We do know one of the biggest reasons that we cannot get um, nerves to recover is the fact that once you have an injury to the spinal cord, the body causes tremendous inflammation around the cord itself and causes a lot of scarring. Okay, And once you develop that scar, that nerve, that axon cannot reconnect. So right now, there are a couple trials. One of the main trials is using a drug to hold down the inflammation. It's almost... Having your bo- stopping your body from hurting yourself. So if you have a spinal cord injury, we will give you a small molecule or drug that really tries to, it's almost an immunosuppressive that will stop your own body from causing the inflammation. And hopefully that will decrease the scar around the spinal cord. And then your, your natural ability of that axon or that kind of nerve fiber regenerating is enhanced because it doesn't have to go through scar. Now, that's being done. There have been many agents that have been applied. And there recently, there has been shown some success. Like, um, I was always kind of bearish in the past, but I've seen some results now that I'm thinking, you know, yeah, this may help. But given that, when I say that, unfortunately, when I say help, you know, we're not talking about reversing spinal cord injury to this stage. We're really talking about enhancing it, meaning that, you know, a patient, um, you know, may gain a couple levels of kind of function. And what that means is, is that if a, if a patient was going to be a para, uh, quadriplegic, okay, from an injury, maybe we could recover enough that they're only a paraplegic, that they would have the use of their arms, okay? Mm-hmm. Certainly, we're not at the stage where we discovered a molecule that's going to cure it from, you know, being paralyzed to being normal again. But even getting a couple levels from going from para or it's just having or quadriplegic to the use of your arms is huge. It's huge in terms of function. Even getting just elbow function back versus shoulder function is incredible. Just that little change can make a huge difference in patients with spinal cord injury. Okay. The other the other avenue of research obviously is is to re- try to help the regeneration of the fiber or the axon or the nerve fiber across the injury site. And that's where cells or stem cell therapy has certainly come about. Okay. There is a stem cell trial underway, okay, in the US, but these trials are very well controlled and they have to be done right at the right time. So We've, we've seen that we have the best results right at the time of injury when we can get the cells in immediately, all right? Mm-hmm. The problem is, is that the most desperate patients are those who have had the injury 
and now have quadriparesis or paraparesis or a significant neurologic deficit that already have the scarring because the injury was six months ago or a year ago or two years ago, okay? Mm -hmm. And still to this day, there's very, very little evidence, and I hate to say this, that cell therapy is truly able to enhance their recovery, okay? Mm -hmm. So... Even though we're at the beginning stages, obviously the easiest is to cure is the ones that we can get there the soonest. And hopefully with a combination of a small molecule or a drug and cellular therapy, we can start treating patients later on in the cascade. So maybe they can be a day out or two months out or four months out. But it's, when you start getting further and further out, it's just so much more difficult to really provide any type of true benefit. And obviously, you know the the field of spinal cord injury is 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 very it's it's a sad field because you know there 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 are a lot of people out there preying on desperation meaning that the patients with spinal cord injuries are certainly very desperate and you know they're prey to many promising medical technologies not just stem cells but you know, some theorem, some extract, some, you know, whatever it may be. And a lot of times these really aren't based on science. So it's really more based on hope and hype. So, and it's very hard to discern. So I, I think, you know, when you look on a scientific basis, when you talk to researchers like myself who treated patients, you know, we know that that spinal cord injury patient who is six months out of their injury it, there is still very little that's been proven scientifically that's, that can truly reverse their injury, okay? Now, there is a tremendous amount of research going in on electrical stimulation or going on in electrical stimulation or functional electrical stimulation, okay? And that is not trying to repair the nerves, okay? What it is is, and we found great success because it's not really repairing the nerves, it's really substituting the nerves, we know that the nerves you know, provide an electrical stimulation. Okay? We've got computers, we've got Apple phones, we've got amazing technology. Where what we do is, is that we create artificial nerves. We can do this by wires. We can find the, the synapse that provides uh, the, the, the charge for the muscle to flex or to contract. And we control that electri electrically with a computer. So kind of overtaking the, the problem of the injury itself. And that has been shown to have great results where we can actually take paraplegics and allow them to walk by just using computer controls that are controlled by the brain. So in that field, you know, I think that there's great progress. Excellent. We're speaking with Dr. Hyun Bae, an orthopedic uh, spine specialist, medical director and education director at Cedar sinai Spine Center in Los Angeles. We're coming to the end of our show and wondered if you have a health tip for us. Sure. Um, health tip. Well, I think for your axial spine, you know, you, you really want to be cognizant of it. Be respectful of the spine. It really holds you up every day and makes you a human, right? <laughs> <clears throat> it makes you very unique. I think if I had a health tip, really core stabilization is so important. Okay. Being of normal weight, you know, try to exercise, try to get aerobic exercise to get your oxygen tension up. And it's so easy. You only need about 10 to 15 minutes, three to four times a week of getting your heart rate up into about the 80 to 85% range of max heart rate. And that will do a tremendous amount to supply the spine with oxygen. And that's not very difficult to ask. The second thing I think is <clears throat> support of the spine. And I think maybe a health tip would be is that every time you walk through a doorway, okay, take two seconds and contract your abs, mm. contract your core muscles, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you do that every day, if you can remember to do that every time you walk into a doorway, you'll probably do about 100 to 200 sit-ups a day. And if you can really do that, that's a good way of just supporting your spine and just reminding yourself that, hey, you know, I've got to keep the thing that's holding me upright in good condition. 
Beautiful. I'm grateful to our very special guest, Dr. Hyun Bae, for sharing his wisdom, expertise, and experience with us. Great show today. I would like to thank all of my teachers and all of my healers for helping me on my path. I look forward to getting together again on Magical Medical Tour with all of you as we explore another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. Thank you very much, Dr. Bay. Thank you, Christina and Segovia and Yoga Hub. Till our next meeting, I wish you all optimal health. Thank you so much, Dr. Bay. I, I got to tell you, I've been bouncing on my ball because all that information, the way you've articulated it, it's so clear and magnificent. And I, I didn't have any room for questions. <laughs> You're covering it all. <laughs> yeah, Thank, yeah. You. Thank you so much for honoring our Absolutely. global community, really. So when's the next show? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Uh, I would also like to thank you, Dr. Glenn Woolman, for hosting such a wonderful show. And of course, to each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We're always grateful for your continuous support, and we look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. If you would like to contact Dr. Hun Bei, please do so at laspine. Dot com, laspine.com. How appropriate. <laughs> and of course, if you would like to connect with Dr. Glenn Woolman through his website, glennwoolman.com, glennwoolman.com, where I do encourage you to learn about his metaphor square breath. That does help the core as well, just to let you know. And again, we would love your feedback and any questions, comments, suggestions. Please Pick up the phone, give us a call, or type it into the comment box. Give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. Until next time, namaste. I've seen some parents who hold on to their child and they just wish that they could like walk into a vet clinic and take the shot like we would give you know, an animal. And well, well, let me just say that there are doctors who assist their patients in this way, um, under the table and, mm -hmm. um, you know, against the law, um, but out of compassion. Um, and of course, no one's going to come forward because if they did, they would be guilty of assisting a suicide or whatever, the yes. uh, uh, a homicide. So, um, but we do know that this happens. Mm -hmm.